Well, good evening, everyone. Why don't you just open in a quick word of prayer. Father, thank you that we can gather here this evening. And thank you, Lord, that uh, your story, it's an exciting story, and we can tell your story again. So, Lord, just open our hearts that we may receive from you this evening. So, as I said, good evening. Shalom, everybody. And your appropriate response is to go, swallow your biscuit and say, Shalom. I can correct it. Shalom. Shalom. You guys are brilliant. And for those of you who will be watching this at, at, at home, shalom to you as well. And um, I pray you'll be able to just open your hearts to what's happening here this evening. So we had a very interesting juncture in the calendar. And today is Palm Sunday. So I got handed one of these when, when, when I came in. And I have absolutely no idea why. Um, but hopefully as we explore what we have on this, on this table, we'll actually uh, connect, connect the dots. So you're probably wondering, well... What's, what are all these items on the table? Cups and candles and unleavened bread and there's even a there's even a shofar over here. I don't exactly have a ram's horn here. I broke the ram's horn but then I got an upgrade, a kudu horn. Okay, you're probably wondering now, what's, what's that got to do with all of this? And uh, we've, we've, we've got uh, all sorts of symbols. There's an onion, there's some apple, there's some salt water, there's a dog in the background. <laughs> I mean, there's like, you just gotta, stuff just happens, just, just, just go with the flow. There's parsley, green stuff, there's this yucky, bitter stuff, okay, horseradish. And then there's an egg here. Um, you're probably wondering what the egg's doing here, I'm also wondering what the egg's doing here, but anyway, it just, it just, it just makes stuff up as we go. Not really. And I've got a bun. Okay, I've got a bone. Any idea which animal this bone came from? Let's just think about that. Okay, so where are we going to begin in our story? Well, the best place to begin any good story is right at the end. <laughs> exactly. Right, so let's begin at the end and let's light these lights. In fact, I'd like one of the ladies to come and light the lights. Come and run! See, look at that enthusiasm. There you go. Light away, light matches perfect. Who is it? Oh, yeah, you do both of them. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And so as, the, as the, the two candles are being lit and we're getting light into our room and light will come into our homes, we just see that the whole picture of light and God speaking in the beginning, let there be light. And at the end of the book, which is a new beginning, there is light. And the light comes from the Lamb. Okay, and the glory, the glory of God is, is our light, much brighter than, than the sun. And we know that God spoke through his prophets and he spoke about a virgin who had conceived and give birth to a son. And later spoken of him, that very boy that was born, he had to be whisked away and hidden in Egypt for a little while because there was a very nervous king who didn't want anyone else to take his throne. Here he tried to kill baby Jesus. So they whisked him away to Egypt for a while before they, they brought him back. But uh, when, when Jesus was presented in the temple at, uh, anyone know how many days he was presented in the temple as Luke records for us? Eight. Forty. Ooh. Okay, would have been okay. Yeah, would have 40, 40 days. Okay, so day eight, that's, that's good. That was when it was certain sounds like day 40 is the one I was looking for. That was one in my head, sorry. I can't see in my head. Okay, it's a good thing. Um, and uh, day 40, he got presented in the temple, and there was a man named Simeon, and he was waiting. We are told he was waiting for God's redemption of Israel. And then he came in, and he's, the Holy Spirit led him in, and he said, My eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. And so at day eight, when he would have been circumcised and named, he was given the name Yeshua, Jesus. What does that mean? God's salvation. So we see in his name, his destiny, and his very, very purpose. So I'm going to read, as I said, I'm going to go to the back of the story over here. And I'm going to read, this is also from Luke. And it's a prophecy under the, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I'm reading out. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed. So those are two important words. Visited and redeemed his people. And has raised up a horn, a horn of salvation for us, in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. 
to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. Okay, I'm sure you recognize that from Luke, Luke's, Luke's account. And there's a lot of words in there, and you notice there was a lot of names in there, a lot of names. So I want to just say from the outset that as we have a look at this table, which is about the Passover and remembering the Passover, this table is actually a foreshadowing of another table, a table that we call communion, our communion table, because communion is actually fulfillment of this table. It's actually, a, if you like, a mini Passover. We just removed a lot of all the other bits, and we've, tonight we've, been, we've brought back all those other bits, well, most of those other bits. We've added lots of extra bits. Okay. Um, if you want to know the simplicity of the story, though, that's what I want to share with you tonight. I don't want us to miss that, because sometimes all the extra bits can make things confusing and actually muddy what, what is actually the key, the key points. So, what I want to tell you from the word go is quite simply this. You're wondering, like, what's Passover about? Where do we find Passover? Um, why, why, why is this important for me tonight, 2022? Like, what relevance does it have in, in my life? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that when I share with you, it'll make sense. From the word go, I'm going to just tell you this. Passover, quite simply, is a change of identity. If you forget anything else tonight, I just want you to remember that. It's a shift in your identity. Passover is found in the book of Exodus, and there we see the identity of our Jewish people at that time. They weren't called Jewish people then. They were the Israelites, the sons of Israel. They were made into slaves. So their identity was a nation of slaves. But that's not our true identity. So God intervenes. When God intervenes, dramatic things happen. And Passover is an identity shift, an identity change. God says, you're not slaves. You're supposed to be my sons and my daughters. And you have an inheritance, you have a future, and you have a hope. That's what Passover is actually all about. So for that to actually happen, to have an identity shift, you need to have a transaction. Okay, there has to be a, sh a transactional occurrence. There's an exchange. That's the only way I can put it. And uh, we have a medium of exchange, it's called money. And with that money, we buy something. Okay? Certain goods have certain value. And, and we hand in the money, and then we can get those goods. Okay. But let me tell you something. Um, changing your identity, you can't do yourself. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can only receive it as a gift. It's an absolute miracle. You cannot do this yourself. And so Passover is an identity change. It's an identity shift. And um, that's what's actually hidden in here. Okay, in case any of you are falling asleep, I think I should make a noise from this. Okay, and any of you who are watching this or also falling asleep, hopefully this will wake you up. I see you already dashing down the hatches. <laughs> okay, let's try. Do you think I can join the worship team? Charlie is very interesting. <laughs> Charlie might actually start answering. I might get an answer. But did you notice that uh, in uh, our reading we spoke about from Luke about a horn, a horn of salvation. Now, what's a horn? Well, he has a horn. Okay, he has a horn. A horn speaks of strength. It speaks of the sound. It speaks of war. It speaks of worship. And it speaks of an alert and an alarm. I mean, when you heard that, you certainly woke up. Even if you had decaf, you would have woken up at, at, that, at that point. And so the reason I'm, I'm bringing this to us is, one, it's in the scripture. Two, it's a reminder that when Abraham had his precious son Isaac, God tested him and said, go offer him up as a burnt offering. But then an exchange happened on the mountain, and God provided a substitute so that Isaac wouldn't have to be sacrificed. Remember Isaac's question, where's the lamb? We got everything else for the offering, knife, fire, wood, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? And what did Abraham say? God will 
provide. And so God stopped him sacrificing his son and he found, well, he looked and there was a ram. A ram. And he said, a ram caught in a thicket. So this isn't a ram's horn, this is a kudu horn. He didn't find a kudu caught there. But this makes quite a dramatic sound. So let's, it just reminds us of that exchange, which we need to just remember is a foreshadowing. A father and a son going up a mountain. Okay. A father and a son going up a mountain. You need to know that Jerusalem is on a mountain. On a mountain. Okay, let's get stuck into what we got on this table. Well, firstly, um, I was showing you this book. Well, I was holding it up. I don't know if you saw it. And it's called The New Identity. And this is the journey of the Passover that we put together. So if you want a copy of this book, you can get hold of me. And uh, I can get you a copy. And it's part of the tradition is, is to tell the story. Every year we've got to tell the story. We sit around the table. We tell the story. You see, we've created this a scene of a table. There's chairs, there's pillows. If any of you want to come and sit here, you're welcome to. But I've heard that maybe you shouldn't. Um, just, I don't know why. I don't know you can. Okay. But the whole idea is a table. It's coming to the table. And um, that's where the, ex the exchange happens. To assist me, I've also got a tablet. Moses had two tablets. <laughs> I've got one because um, I'm a bit more clumsy than Moses and we know he already broke the first set. Now, that carries a warning with it. You know, don't give old people new technology. <laughs> All right. They can break it. It's dangerous. I mean, Moses went up in the cloud. He came down with two tablets. Like, he really did. He got new technology from, 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 from heaven. Okay, so I'm using this tablet so that I can... Um, up the scriptures as, as I need them. Um, I don't know why it's staying in Hebrew, but you know, maybe the first tablet was written in Hebrew. I don't know. We'll have to check it up. Okay. But I'm just getting out the scripture to go to Exodus chapter 12. All right. And in Exodus chapter 12, we actually have the whole land of the Passover. But before we get to Exodus 12, we've got to go to Exodus 11, 10, 9, and all the way to Exodus chapter 1. And when we open, open Exodus chapter 1, what do we see? We see a whole list of names. We see a whole list of names and it starts out, so in the Hebrew, Exodus is actually called Shmot. Do you want to say Shmot? Shmot. 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 You guys are great. Your Hebrew is improving by the minute. <laughs> so Shmot is plural of name, names. And uh, so if, if, if I had to rename the book, because Exodus is Latin, from the Latin meaning to come out, huh? to depart, something like that. But in the Hebrew, yes, we do see a departure and a coming out, exactly. Nothing wrong with the name Exodus, but I want to just shift things a bit. But first, we're looking at identity change. And if we understand that, then we get the meaning of the message here. So in Exodus, it starts out, the way, the way a book starts, Just I just want to tell you, the way a book starts is very, very important. The way a book ends is very, very important. And if you read those two bits, you can normally surmise what the story is actually about, the flow of thought, how we're going to get from the beginning to the end of the book. So it starts out with names, and you've got to ask why. Why these names? Well, it's very, very important. God remembers these names. In the book of Exodus, what's very interesting is that God remembers these names, and we get to discover God's name. Moses meets God at the burning bush. Remember, God reveals his name, and God also reveals his mission to, to Moses at, at the bush. But what's so interesting is that in the flow of, of thought, is that we encounter the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, he's not named. His deeds are recorded. He's not named. That's very, very significant. Very, very important. Everyone else is named. And God remembers all their names. Why does God remember our name? He knows our name. And he's intimately involved with us. So God remembers us, and we get to know his name. And uh, when Jesus sat around that Passover table, now the Last Supper was a Passover, and part of what they would do is they would tell the story. But Jesus then takes that story and he weaves himself into it now. And he's he basically is showing them, this story is actually my story. I was actually in that story before. But maybe you didn't realize that now I'm going to introduce myself. I mean, all, all the parts and the features of that, that very story. And, and his disciples, they're sitting around the table and they're looking a little bit like you. A little bit confused and dazed and maybe... You shouldn't have decaf coffee next time. Just have a regular. <laughs> so it'll get, get you going. But um, as 
as the, they, they told the story, and as the, as the evening um, unfolded, Jesus revealed the key elements of that story, which would tie him directly to the Passover. So let's look at some of those elements. Let's start exploring them. We'll start with cups. So there are four cups here. Practically, we actually only use one cup and we just refill the cup. So the tradition is three to four times in the course of the evening. Okay. First cup, we start the ceremony off. The cup of blessing. We, we bless everything that is, is to follow. And if you remember in, in, in the Gospels, you'll see Jesus takes the cup and he shares it amongst them. That would have been that first cup. Okay. So we'll just move it to the side. Then in the course of the evening, what does Jesus do? He takes bread. You notice that? He takes bread. Okay. And remember I said we've added a lot of traditions. So one of our traditions is to put the bread, that's unleavened bread, it's called matzah. Can we say matzah? <laughs> and what we do is we actually put it in a pouch. There's three, we put three pieces of the bread in the pouch. And what you're supposed to do is take out the middle one. So Jesus would have taken bread and he would have broken it amongst his disciples. Now, and, and shared it. And he would have said, remember me. When he did that, he broke it and he spoke about his body and he spoke about remembering him. Now, you're probably wondering, what's he doing? I mean, why is he telling us to remember him? What's going on? I mean, I mean Jesus was talking about his departure. He's going to die. No, no, this isn't supposed to happen. Let me show you the bread. Can you see it? Can you see? I'm going to just let you see this bread's very peculiar. Firstly, it's flat because there's no yeast in it. Okay, there's no leaven in this bread. Then, when it's prepared, it's baked, and it goes brown. It gets all mottled. It looks like it's been bruised. But what I want you to see is the holes. The light shines through. Okay, so this bread's very, very interesting. It's not a regular bread. It's not all puffed up with, with yeast. This is unleavened, and so it's flat. It's been mottled. It looks like it's bruised, and it looks like it's been pierced. So Jesus would have shared the bread amongst his disciples. I'm going to break the bread as well. This bread that gets broken. And part of our tradition is to take this bread and hide it away. So we're supposed to wrap it up in a white cloth. I'm just going to put it in this little pouch. And then this would be hidden away and the children would have to find it later. So I'm just going to put it over there. You all saw where it was. You might be wondering, why do we do that? Why do we take a piece of bread and we break it and we hide some away and then we have to find some, some later. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. Just a quick question. Do you wonder why there are three breads here? Just a thought. Why are there are three? And why do we take the middle of the three and break it? Well, when, when God encounters Moses at the burning bush and tells Moses that he's fully aware of the situation in Egypt. Remember, Moses is now 80 years old. Yes, 80. Okay, anyone here 80? King Dog is 80. Yeah, he could be 80 in dog years. All right, maybe even more. So Moses at age 80, he's in the wilderness. He tried to rescue his people. 40 years prior, failed, ran away, in exile, looking after sheep. And one day, God encounters him. God speaks to him. Have you noticed that when God speaks to men, he uses their name twice? Moses, Moses, Abraham, Abraham. And then when he meets a woman, he says, Mary. And he says it once. Why is that? I don't know. This is a really deep mystery. You'll have to figure that out. Men don't listen. <laughs> say, say something like men don't listen. I don't know. I don't know. Us men will have to figure, figure this one out. So God calls Moses and he tells him he's come, he's seen, he's heard, he's remembered. He's remembered their names. He's remembered the covenant and he's going to act. And I'm sure Moses is like really excited at this point. And then God says, I'm sending you. You go speak to Pharaoh. At that point, what does Moses do? I, I think he, he did something like this. Ba, 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 ba. He broke out in tongues. Okay. <laughs> First occurrence of tongues in scripture. And Moses is like, you got the wrong guy. I can't even speak. I'm, I'm not good at this. And he, he probably was feeling like really washed up and his first attempt didn't work. But God knew, knew, knew what he was doing. And it's quite incredible seeing the shift in identity. In Moses as his confidence grows as he realizes God is with him. God is not going to leave him. God is faithful and true. 
And so what happens is there's this whole showdown and the whole confrontation between the God of Israel and the gods of the Egyptians. And Moses is told, Pharaoh's not going to listen to you, but I'm going to get glory. Everyone's going to get to know me and they're going to get to know my name. They're going to know my identity. In the world of many gods, there is only one true God. And his identity will be known. And Passover is about revealing his name so that we can know his identity, we can know his character, know his purpose, so that we can know our own identity. We can never know who we truly are until we've met the one who made us, destined us, purposed us, and who has a name for us. You know he's got another name for us. He's got a name that only he knows that he came to reveal to us one day. So that's where we find our true identity. But for that to happen, there's a confrontation and there's a conflict. You cannot receive your inheritance and you cannot receive your identity unless there's a fight. Yes, there's a fight. It's never easy. There's always a fight. That's how this works. There's a battle for you to get your new name, to get your identity. And so Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, of course, terrible misunderstanding. Off you go with back wages. Back back. Is that what happened? No, if it did, there wouldn't be like 12 chapters before you get to, to the final plague and you get to the Passover. No. Pharaoh said, no, I don't know this God. I don't know his name. I don't know Yahweh. Who is he? I'm not going to listen to him. So the Pharaoh who's not named does not know the name that's most important. You see, Pharaoh thought that he was the one who granted life and death in Egypt. At, at one point, Pharaoh was, was so threatened that he said, right, throw the babies into the Nile. The boy babies, into the Nile. Okay, gone. Destroy them. But remember, God saved one. Moses. In a little ark. Sounds like Noah, huh? Eh? On the water. Saved one. And he grew up in Pharaoh's household, learning all about Egypt and all the cult culture and customs. And as I said, he had a flea. And now he's back and he's 80 years old and he is dangerous. Why? Because God's with him. And God's got him on a mission. Because Moses has to fulfill his destiny. Moses needs to know who he really is. Moses doesn't know who he is until he meets God and God starts to work with him and through him. Who is Moses? Moses is a Levite. Any Levites here tonight? Maybe some of you are wearing Levites. <laughs> you know what a Levite is? Well, Moses was in a family line with the Levites. Little did Moses know that he was a warrior. A warrior. A warrior priest. That's who God was raising him up to, to be. To go and do battle. Go and do battle with the Egyptian gods and goddesses who are holding the people captive, not letting them go. So what happens is, as we come to cup number two, we see God sends the plagues and one by one, those Egyptian gods fall like dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. Gone. Finished. Wiped out. Isn't it so interesting that even the magicians, when, when we get to the third plague that was sent, in Hebrew the word is, okay, well let's, let's just quickly check your knowledge. What is the First plague. Excellent, I hear they water to blood. Lovely. Second plague. I've got the crib notes here. Frogs. Yes, frogs. And the magicians in Pharaoh's court, they were able to replicate those plagues. But when you get to plague number three, were they able to replicate that? No, they weren't. And the magicians themselves said, This is the finger of God. This is the the God of Israel, we can't match this. So can you see, they themselves bore testimony to the greater authority that was now being manifested in their very sight and in, in, in their very day. So interesting. But Pharaoh wouldn't even listen to them. He wouldn't listen to them. And so his heart went through a process of, of hardening. And as I mentioned, cup number two is when we remember the plagues. We'll dip our finger in the cup. And we drop drops onto our plates as we count all the plates down. Now that brings us to the actual Passover, which is in Exodus chapter 12. And that's a good section to go read. It's a good summary. And what happens in the Passover is God gives us a calendar. Now having a calendar and having a time frame is very, very important because that orientates you to your story. Everyone needs to be orientated to where we are in the story. So the story actually... A new beginning happens with the new identity by God giving us a new calendar. 
So he gives us the first month of his calendar. And in that month, from then on, once we were free, we would commemorate, we would remember what God did because God remembered us. He remembered our names. And so our names would journey with him. We would journey with him. So what do we see in the calendar? So interesting. God says, right, this is going to be your first month. Now here are your instructions. On the 10th day of this month, on the 10th day of this month, why am I holding this up? What's this got to do with the 10th day of the month? Well, that's going to be playing with the palms. 10th of the first month in the Hebrew calendar is when Jesus entered Jerusalem. And he was greeted with palms. What's the significance of that? Palms. The people must have known something. Every, every symbol carries a meaning. Okay? So, this looks like a sword. Interesting. Okay. Don't get distracted. Let's focus. <laughs> they welcomed him with palms on the 10th day of the first month. In Exodus 12, we are told on the 10th day you select the lamb that you're going to sacrifice. The lamb must be perfect. No spots, no blemishes. Okay. That's the connection over here. That lamb had to be observed till the 14th. On the 14th, what did we do? We sacrificed the lamb. Okay. So Jesus sitting around the table, remember he took a cup and then he shared it amongst his disciples. And this time with the cup, what does he say? Cup in my blood. Poured out for the sins of many. New covenant. He tied all those pieces together for us. Okay, remember he had spoken about his body. Now he speaks about his blood, his lifeblood. Now what happened in Egypt? Well, in Egypt, what we had to do is we had to take some hyssop, okay? And we had to dip it in the blood of that lamb that had been sacrificed on the 14th. Remember, we selected it on the 10th. Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th. And that lamb would be sacrificed on the 14th. So that's when Jesus would have died. Okay. What do we have to do in Egypt? Dip the hyssop. And we had to, well, I don't have any doorposts here, and I don't think I can hit those doorposts, but we had to take the blood of the lamb and strike the lintel, strike the two doorposts. Okay, that's what we did in Egypt. Why? Because God said the tenth plague would be devastating. Not that the others would, but now the firstborn would all be targeted. So to escape that, we had to put blood, seal our homes with blood, the blood of a perfect lamb. And so death would pass over. That's where we get the name Passover. Easy, eh? All the answers are in the book. Okay. I just want to tell you all there will be a quiz. I won't be giving it. The answers are all in the book. They're all there. They're all in the book. It's an open book test for anyone to read and find all the answers that, that we need. And so now, that's exactly what happened. Death passed over our homes and we could now leave. We could depart from Egypt. But let's pause a little bit. Let's think about what we were leaving. Well, we need to remember the bitterness of the identity of a slave. That was our old identity. Slaves. When you're a slave, you don't have a name. You only have a number. Understand that. Our ancestors were reduced to brick quotas. Brick numbers. Produce your quota. That's all you are. Produce your brick making factory. Produce your quota. You have no name. Slave has no name. Just produce bricks. So how do we symbolize that bitterness of the slavery? Well, we have a whole lot of items. We've got an onion here, okay, to represent the roots, this deep-rooted bitterness. We've got horseradish, okay. Does anyone want to taste? Mm. Oh, you all so excited. We will break and we'll dip and we'll taste the bitterness of the slavery. And then we've got a very interesting mixture. We, we, we start with apple and honey and nuts. We blend it up and it looks actually like dog food. Charlie would really like it, I think. But that mixture is to remind us of the bricks. Remember the slavery, making a quota of bricks. But it's sweet. Why is it sweet? Well, sweet is the promise. The promise that we're going to have an identity shift because God's getting involved. He's going to honor his word and set us free. And change us from slaves to sons and daughters, with a hope, a future, and an inheritance. 
Okay, what else do I need to tell you? Oh, I've got some salt water here. Let me make some stuff up. Okay, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you do this enough, you know, you, you, I, I really like salt water. The salt water has so many meanings. One, it reminds us when we were slaves, by the sweat of our brow, we were making those bricks. It also reminds us that God spoke to Adam and said, by the sweat of your brow, you will get your bread. Until you return to the ground from which you were taken, from the, from the dust. Okay. Oh, I better show you this as well. This is a shank bone of a lamb. Charlie might be interested in this. Okay. And it's a reminder of the Passover lamb. Okay. Remember the lamb. But remember Jesus, he's called the Lamb of God. Why do you think he's called the Lamb? Because the whole story revolves around us understanding what God was foreshadowing and what God was fulfilling. That's why. It's very intentional. It's very purposeful. It's not a coincidence. It's not a mistake. This was God's plan all along. His plan was that he would send the Redeemer of Israel, the Savior, the one who would deliver us from the hand who was too strong for us, he would take that hand and he would break it, smash it, and grind it into dust. Yes, we've got a dangerous God. You need to understand that God is dangerous. He's called a warrior for a reason. And so when John, in his old age, was called into heaven and he heard a proclamation by a mighty angel saying, Behold, the line of Judah has triumphed. He looked and he saw what? A slaughtered lamb. Okay. Our king is a lion lamb. Okay. He's the servant. And he's, he, that's who he is. Isn't it incredible? A lamb who's a lion. And a lion who's a lamb. That's all this connection for us. Okay, let's move to the salt water. Yeah, I need to take us to the salt water. If I've forgotten anything, just remind me. Okay. When we left Egypt, um, God did not take us the easy way. Or maybe it wasn't the easy way. I don't know. He's in agreement. We didn't go up the coast to the land of the Philistines to go to Canaan. Okay. God took us into the desert. And he actually led us a very, very interesting way. He took us to a place where we would literally be between the devil and the deep blue sea. There was nowhere out. He led us down this channel to a beach. The wave of beach. You can Google that. That's where he actually took us. Okay. And the Egyptians were pursuing us with their army. We were stuck. But God had a plan. Is that clear? Sir? The trap to swallow up their army. So he opened the water. And we went through. I see you all excited. That's good. We serve a big God. Big miracles. Okay. Dangerous God. Good God. Holy. Righteous. This is the God I want on my side. I can't afford to serve a, a little God. A God who's impotent has no power to save me because I need lots of power to save me. Okay, and change me and shift my identity. That's the God I serve. And that's the God I want you to know that you serve too. And uh, so he opens the water, we go through. But it's a trap. The Egyptians pursued and in the salt water, he, he drowned them and he destroyed them. And then when we got to the other side, what did we do? Yeah, I know we complained. No, that came later. That's later chapter. Before the complaining, what did we do? We sang a song. Now, that's what true worship's about. True worship's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about him. Okay. True worship is about the lamb that was slain. Okay. That's what true worship is about. It's about all of this. And what he did. And what the Passover is actually all about. And so when we got to the other side of the water, we sang a new song. A new song because God had shifted our identity. And you can read it in Exodus 15. And the song's all about him and who he is and his name. And what his name means. And what he's done. That's true worship. It's never about us. Although we, interestingly, are the focus of his love. And his attention. But he's fully interested in us. He wants us to be fully interested in, in him. Right, have I left anything out? Yeah, you're probably wondering about this little cup over there. Don't worry about it. Just 
don't ask. You're probably wondering about the egg. Don't worry about it, don't ask. Um, okay, these are traditions that get added along the way. You won't find them in the text, you won't find them in the word. The egg's there because, you know, with time, other things happen. So the egg reminds us that one day when we settled in the Promised Land, God had us build a temple where his presence would dwell. That temple was destroyed. So the egg reminds us of the temple that was destroyed. That's what the egg is. So another bit of sadness. And then what's this cup over here? This is supposed to be for Elijah. Now Elijah is very, very important. If you have a look at scripture, you'll see it's very, very interesting. Between what we call the Old and New Testament, you see a single white page. Normally, if you've just got a regular Bible, if you've got a study Bible, you've got about 40 pages between um, what we call Old and, and New, T New Testament. And that single white page is very, very important because it separates what we call Old and New. But it's actually one word of God, revelation of God from the beginning to the end, which is just another beginning. Okay. So, this cup is for Elijah because at the end of Malachi, we see God talking about Elijah. And he's going to send Elijah. Okay. Okay, he's going to send Elijah. And that's what that's for. And then when we open up the New Testament, we meet an interesting character. And I'm going to read from Luke. And you, child, that's who we're talking about here. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. That's who he's in view now. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So who's in view there? Another little baby boy. His name was Yochanan. John. What does Yochanan mean? It means God's grace. So God's grace would prepare the way for God's salvation. And uh, we see John would baptize Jesus in the Jordan, and then the Holy Spirit would come him. And then Jesus would go to start doing battle. Battle as our warrior priest. And that's what he calls us to do. He's in turn to take up his mantle. Once he changed our identities and shifted our identities. And the identity shift happens because a great price was paid when Jesus died on that cross outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. Okay? So that we could be forgiven and have our identity changed. That's not automatic. I just want to tell you that's not automatic. You don't get that identity change automatically. Just as when you park a car in a garage, that car doesn't change uh, if it's a Toyota and you park it, it comes out of the Mercedes, does it? You can go sit in the garage, you turn into a car. No. What has to happen is a transaction. And it's actually quite simple. It's a matter of surrender, and just humbling yourself before the creator of the universe, God Almighty, and, and saying quite simply, I surrender. All I give you is my old identity, my brokenness, my sin and my shame, my confusion and my guilt. And in exchange, I want your life. Give me your life and your forgiveness and change me. That's the transaction that occurs. And no one can do that for you, only yourself. You and the creator of the universe. And that's the invitation he gives you. And that's what Passover is all about. So that you can change your identity. And become his sons and daughters. Become his mighty warriors. And, I mean, us old people, um, we've done our time. Or made for some of it. <laughs> but I just want to encourage you. The generation that's coming up. You're very important. And you have a very important role to play. And I want to just tell you that you know that most of the disciples of Jesus, they were probably teenagers. They were very young. And uh, Mary, who, who gave birth to Jesus, she was a teenager. Okay. So God uses young people, hallelujah, as well as old people like Moses. Okay. <laughs> he uses all the generations, but just to encourage you. Okay. Can I just say a word of prayer? Let me close with a word of prayer. And then I'm going to hand back. Father, I just thank you for the privilege we have to share here. And I pray, Lord, for those who are listening and for those who will be watching this, that uh, you'll speak to their hearts. And uh, they'll feel fed. And they'll be overflowing, Lord, with 
but just a revelation of you and what you've done and the meaning of the Passover, Lord, fulfilled in you, Lord Jesus, when you died and then when you rose again. Amen. Amen. Oh, Amen. there's more. <laughs> okay, so we search for the, the children search for this hidden piece of bread and they bring it out at the end and then we'll break it and eat it and that'll be the last food we, we eat. And why did we do that? Well, because Jesus was hidden, the bread that came down from heaven, he was revealed and uh, then he was broken for us. He died on the cross, he was pierced. Left, he died, and then he was buried, and then on the third day, he rose. He rose again. Amen and amen. So any questions, you're welcome to come ask me afterwards, and if you want to journey with this book, I have copies available. Thank you. Cool.